we are back on the Zero Hour. I am your host, Richard R.J. Escal. There's been an intensified level of conversation in the last 10 days or so since the Capitol Hill riot uh, about the state of American democracy, which made me think of uh, a piece written in Jacobin recently by my Next guest, uh, Nicole Ashoff, is on the editorial board of Jacobin. Her latest book is The Smartphone Society, Technology, Power, and Resistance in the New Gilded Age, a book I intend to read and talk to her about in the near future. Um, But the article that came to mind uh, after the riot was uh, the piece she wrote for the latest edition, uh, American Capitalism is Working that's the problem. So I wanted to see what she was thinking now in light of recent events. So first of all, Nicole Ashoff, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, Richard. Oh, it's it, it's uh, it's a pleasure. And uh, you know, there were really the 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 headline, at least on the uh, online version, is the one I just read. But really, the primary theme to me is failed state. Is America a failed state? And I don't want to uh, inaccurately summarize uh, your thesis here, but I, I think I think at least one of the points you're making here is that for the people that this uh, government is designed to serve, it's not failing at all. If, uh, I mean, let's start with that. Is that a fair conclusion to draw from your piece? Yeah, I would say that's sort of the, the second point. I, I decided to write this short piece Um, just because, you know, in the last, particularly over the summer and into the fall as the election, um, you know, campaign heated up, I read more and more accounts of uh, the United States being a failed state. Um, And, you know, it certainly at many moments over the past year has felt like the United States is a failed state. But I wanted to uh, actually clarify and to push people to um, not kind of resort to this shorthand. Um, in the first case, because the term failed state is actually, um, you know, it has a specific meaning and it's often um, used in sort of academic circles and foreign policy circles to refer to states that are completely collapsed um, sort of split into warring territories with uh, non-functional infrastructure, uh, currency that is uh, has no value, these kinds of things. So I wanted to encourage people to um, not necessarily, uh, you know, resort to this kind of extreme term, both because it's inaccurate, but also um, because it can tend to um, confuse the issue, kind of muddy the waters as to um, our understanding of what actually is going on. So I, I made the point uh, just to kind of give people um, something to to chew on um, in this article that um, in many respects, uh, the United States government and particularly the Federal Reserve has been incredibly nimble uh, during the crisis to protect the interests of uh, capital, right? And the biggest corporations and also elites um, and how quickly um, and efficiently it returned to this kind of policy of quantitative easing and pumping trillions of dollars um, into the American economy. And it has just recently stated it plans to do to do this kind of debt purchases, uh, you know, which is now about $120 billion a month indefinitely. So when we think about the United States as a failed state, I think it's really important for us to kind of step back and say, instead of, um, you know, even though, and we can talk about how it is failing in many respects, um, but in many respects, it's been very successful. So I think it's important to kind of tease out these nuances so we can really make demands about where we need to fix things. Well, I think that's a great point. And Nicole, uh, you're a sociologist by training, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it seems to me when I hear the phrase failed state, especially since I read your piece, uh, you know, I think about what's being signaled here, right? In other words, not just the meaning of the words themselves, but uh, the sort of broader subliminal message being conveyed. And to me, when I hear certain people use a term like failed state, to describe the United States, you explain, you know, the term came into being regarding the collapse of uh, uh, civil authority in Somalia and so on. But what I really hear sort of on a 
high frequency, like dog whistle frequency, is uh, we are losing our exceptionalism. That, in other words, we when someone says of a certain, you know, in foreign policy magazine or wherever, we're in danger of becoming a failed state. I, partially, I hear them saying, we're, this is making us a little bit less superior to the rest of humanity. Do you get what I'm trying to drive at here? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that um, certainly the United States has been less superior than the rest of humanity for some time coming. Um, I'm not embracing the yeah. viewpoint. I'm just, <laughs> no, yeah, I, just yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, particularly when we look at the incoming Biden administration and his, uh, and I actually, I wrote about this in, a, in, a, in the next print issue for Jacobin, but this, uh, this sort of, um, you know, reassurance that Biden is, is offering the world that the United States is ready to once again take up the mantle of global leadership. And no one is really asking the United States to do that because as you were saying, um, the, you know, the past year, and the way that the United States has failed in its uh, attempts, however uh, we can characterize these attempts to deal with this um, horrible pandemic, is really indicative of a broader kind of crisis in the United States. And while we can't characterize it as a failed state, certainly uh, we can see a kind of dismantling of the apparatus to kind of support and, uh, you know, actually look out for the interests of ordinary people um, at the expense of, you know, sort of the biggest corporations and, and the wealthiest Americans. So I think certainly, um, you know, we can see this as a kind of law, the culmination of a crisis, right? Just as we could see Trump as kind of a culmination of, of growing distrust um, in, you know, um, govern, governing institutions in the United States. And it's interesting to me too, I was thinking as you were talking, Nicole, that um, we're not even getting, you know, Samantha Power has just been named uh, head of the US Agency for International Development, I, I understand, but we're not even getting that sort of superficial, the United States is now a failed state, so let's have some humanitarian aid for the people, even if it's purely symbolic, there are not gonna be any military convoys with MREs being, hand I mean, it, it, you know, it's just, it's, it, it seems to me almost entirely a ritualized, uh, uh, you know, invocation. I mean, you, you quote, and then I do want to get to recent events, but uh, a couple of your, several of the quotes are quite striking. George Packer, who I, you know, often disagree with, but I think he's an intelligent person. Uh, Americans woke up to found the, find themselves citizens of a failed state. Are we still capable of self-government, which to me is a naive question because it, it assumes that we had, uh, you know, a fully functioning democracy to begin with. And I've got to believe that George Packer knows better than that. And you quote, and then, and then uh, I'll just a couple more, just one more quote, I guess, but Tom Engel, Engelhardt, who's a good guy, I like him, uh, says the U.S. is, quote, afloat in its new autocratic climate changing, et cetera, et cetera, carnage that should, that should qualify it as distinctly third world as well. You know, again, even from Tom Engelhardt, this sense that, you know, we've lost, uh, we, we've wandered from some Garden of Eden politically and economically that, uh, you know, I'm not sure we ever lived in, and certainly not in the last 75 years. Uh, you think that's an overly cynical way to look at things? I was a bit struck um, when I was reading these recent accounts by um, the kind of sense of urgency and recent breakdown. Certainly, um, there's uh, the, the tendency to, to make 2008 and 2010 as this incredible break while I understand that, and I think that was a, um, a very important crisis, um, not least because it really um, uh, created a kind of legitimacy crisis for the kind of ruling project of the past 40 years. But this tendency, as you're alluding to, to um, you know, date this kind of breakdown or this emergence of a failed state um, to you know, the recent years, I think is, is a bit of a mistake. It could just be that, you know, 
Hacker or Engelhard are again using this uh, term "failed state" as a as a kind of shorthand or or to kind of sound the alarm, right? To to make people kind of wake up and realize the crisis at hand. But I think it's worth um, being a bit more nuanced uh, because at this moment it's really important um, to actually diagnose what, what what has happened, not just in the past year, but in the past ten. 20 years, 20 years to really, to really think, think about how we can actually move forward and, and, and figure this out. It's if, if, if we are imagining um, that we no longer possess the capacity to uh, self-govern or that, um, you know, that our democracy is on the verge of collapse, this engenders very different types of politics um, than an assessment that says, let's actually look at where the state has directed its energies and resources and where it and 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 where it has not, where it has actually um, ignored the needs of ordinary people. Of course, we see this in the coronavirus right uh, yeah. response, but we can see it more generally. And again, we're talking with Nicole Ashoff, who's uh, about our article, "American Capitalism Is Working." That's the problem uh, for Jacobin. And yeah, to me, my most dreaded outcome, uh, Nicole. Well, I mean, I, I guess I could think of worse ones, but we. It, it, uh, if we start thinking that 2010 was the zenith of American democracy and we were a functioning state, well, I remember 2010, 10, and we had only 6% of the population saying that the budget deficit was our highest priority, and yet the leaders of both parties insisted on making it the top priority of government to address, and nobody uh, in our two-party electoral system, very few voters had the option to choose somebody whose pri priorities aligned with their, their own. So you quote Harvard University's Robert Rotberg uh, so, uh, about the, the, uh, the, the elements of a successful state, security, okay, we could talk about that, an independent judiciary, I would argue we are, uh, to what the extent we had that, we were losing it, the ability to participate in the political system. Also, I mean, these are all to me sliding scales that were declining significantly before recent years. Medical and healthcare, almost a question answers itself. Schools and educational infrastructure, instruction, good infrastructure. The American Society of Civil Engineers gives our infrastructure a D minus and has for many years. A sound money and banking system, well, we know what they did to us in 2008, uh, and so on. So environmental protection. So, I mean, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but obviously, to me, it's it, 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 if we start thinking, well, as soon as we get back to the bipartisan order, uh, that had uh, John Boehner and Barack Obama discussing which programs to cut first in 2011. I would argue we, to the, we're not we're not a successful state at that point. But uh, uh, do, if you have anything to say about that, feel free. Otherwise, I kind of want to pivot to the last few days, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, we can pivot. Okay, so you wrote this piece, and uh, you know, and as I say, I really appreciated it, and. Um, then, well, that happened, as they say. Uh, so, so we had the riot, and you know, I mean, I think. Look, I I expected something like this, and I was shocked. So, I certainly understand. You can expect something and still find it shocking, right? And, and I didn't expect this specific thing at this specific time. So, I get the shock. I, I, I certainly do, and it was awful, and all of those things. But I'm wondering, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, this, uh, you know, I thought of this piece after the riot, and um, I'm wondering if you thought of it too, first of all. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, when you say that the United States is not a failed state, a lot of people will kind of get up in arms and say, well, look at all of, all of the ways that it is failing. And I think that we should do that. Um, but more... Uh, moreover, in the past week, you know, when you see these kinds of scenes of mobs, you know, ascending on the Capitol, it's jarring and uh, saddening. And, and it does look like uh, if this isn't a failed state, you know, what is? But I th think we need to step back again and, and really kind of, um, you know, not only just assess what happened, um, but to try to understand um, you know, where to move forward. And part of that is understanding, um, you know, it's very confusing to me, the people that 
that uh, kind of ascended in, into the Capitol building, what exactly are their demands, right? And if we think about them as a, uh, a section of America, are they representative of some kind of, uh, you know, broader set of demands? Uh, or is this um, more of a sign of a, of a, of a complete breakdown of trust um, and uh, in institutions of a large section of, of the United States or, or both? And I think these are really important questions to answer, right? We can say, yes, uh, we shouldn't rely on this kind of shorthand of, of uh, you know, saying that the United States is on the verge of collapse. Um, but at the same time, we really need to get a better grip on what exactly the crisis is that we're facing, right? Because on the one hand, we have um, a, a very smooth functioning, uh, you know, fiscal, uh, uh, mon excuse me, monetary policy and system that's set up to uh, support Wall Street and, 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 you know, elites. But on the other hand, we see these kind of cracks below the surface of people who are angry enough angry to enough. actually, you know, walk into the Capitol and people who are quietly angry, who are, you know, uh, lining up for food banks and who have lost their jobs and are about to be evicted, right? And so we have to think about how do we actually understand this crisis? And I think that this is something that's really necessary. Um, but to do that, we have to get beyond the kind of shock of what we saw last week mm -hmm. and have, have a deeper analysis. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, I, I've obviously, like everyone, been doing a lot of thinking about this and writing about it. And to me, I keep going back to, I mean, political science studies are, you know, like all studies of, of nature, imperfect. But I keep going back to the study that was done a couple of years ago, I think, uh, that showed this enormous level across most Western democracies of, uh, as we define them, uh, of fury at elites, at, coupled with what they described as, what those authors described as, uh, rather poetically as, a desire to burn down the democratic cosmos, is the way they put it. And to me, it's, uh, you know, I actually, that part I get, uh, you know, in other words, there are a lot of people in in this country and in this you know in the industrialized world who or post industrialized world who you know have very legitimate reasons to be angry and to me uh, I'm not justifying the, the, the violence or the racism or the you know, the hideous things we saw but I you know when uh, I'm going through the poll numbers now and you know one in five Republicans still thinks this is justified they're not all just deplorables we you know some of them are I'm sure you know lovely people in their private lives so uh, and uh, you know then we have this uh, this tendency in here in Washington of dismissing anyone on the left or right who, who uh, uh, objects to the current elite order as a quote unquote populist, as if, you know, populism wasn't a bedrock of what democracy should be. So I guess it's a roundabout way of saying, first of all, of agreeing with you and saying, you know, to me anyway, that if you can get past the revulsion at the horrible people who did horrible things and look at the sort of soil from which they emerged and the broader number of people who largely think two thirds, more than two thirds of Republicans think Trump did nothing wrong in inciting this and so on, or, or didn't even incite it, then, you know, if you can't figure out what that's about, I think we on the left are in serious trouble going forward. But, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with you in this, particularly in this sense, um, you know, one of the things that was most depressing to me, you know, in the outcome of the election was that we're left with an incredibly polarized country um, where there doesn't seem to be a broad sense of a shared horizon to work toward. And I think that this is, um, you know, not totally, but in large part, the result of the failure of a kind of progressive populist vision um, and, and the failure to develop 
the kind of working class voice and institutions to actually, uh, you know, provide something to hold on to uh, for ordinary people, a kind of vision and a platform to to build towards something. I think that Bernie Sanders was, you know, starting to build something like this, which is why he was you know, had a sort of huge surge of support. But this is something that we need to move toward. And as much as Trump is awful, and, you know, a lot of his followers are just kind of awful people, we have to get past this kind of culture war, um, you know, framing, and to really think hard about how to actually bring people together, particularly people who are really struggling, and to actually come up with a kind of project that can appeal to people that live in cities and rural areas, um, and, you know, that might not agree on a lot of things, but right. can certainly agree on the need to actually sort of lift people up. And I think that this is, this is really essential. You know, I worked for Bernie in 2015, 2016, and one of the things that uh, really struck me about him, uh, particularly seeing him, you know, in a crowd, uh, even before he was, you know, before things caught on with him, is he talked to everybody with respect. And, you know, he would talk to Trump voters who thought he was, you know, uh, um, a danger to society and, you know, and, and he would listen to them and he would argue, you know, he, he wouldn't like uh, uh, flatter them. He would argue with them or, you know, whatever, but he would listen to them. And it seems to me that we need a lot more of that, that we need to be, you know, as left, I consider, I'm a leftist, you know, uh, um, but I, if I, I'm not willing to talk to anybody about any, I mean, not if they're coming at me with a gun or a knife or zip ties or whatever, but if I'm not willing to say to somebody that, you know, your boss is a, a communist and, uh, you know, go to hell. And uh, if I'm not willing to say, Hey, you know, that's your opinion, but why do you say that? Then uh, a lot, I guess I'm saying that, so speaking of culture, there's a lot of culture on the left that just says, I don't talk to people like that. And okay, but then maybe political activism isn't your game. Because to me, what comes with that is you, you don't change the future by talking to people who already agree with you. And, and I, I'm just wondering where sort of broadly speaking, in this case, the left or left of center, you know, out to where we are. It's like, uh, how much there's a culture that you think that maybe needs to shift on our side in order to be open to, you know, people whose views we might not like. Yeah, I think certainly there's, um, there's been this part of the polarization dynamic is the sense that if someone doesn't agree with you on, you know, certain core principles that you may hold that you feel like it's impossible to engage with that person, that they are less moral and less deserving of your attention, which is understandable, but is not super productive in terms of actually building um, the kind of, you know, grassroots base to challenge um, the real beneficiaries of the last 30 years of policy, which have, have been, you know, the richest Americans and, and global corporations. How do you actually take them on to, you know, make sure people have health care and good jobs um, and dignity and safety, right? This is this is the goal. I think one of the places where, you know, people, working people of all walks of life used to interact um, and organize was through, you know, labor unions, right? And you'd have a lot of people who maybe didn't agree on much beyond a desire to have a dignified and well, you know, well-paid job. And I think, you know, they offer in many ways a good example of how to actually have sort of issue-based movements, right, to move forward. Say it's something around, you know, Medicare for all and to say, let's actually focus on this and try to set aside our beliefs about various things and just see if we can, you know, get this kind of, um, you know, policy passed, which is something that would benefit, you know, all kind of ordinary people. So I, think, I mean, just in terms of like practically, there's no easy answers here. There's no shortcuts, right? A lot of it is, is as exactly as you said, this sort of need or, or willingness to actually get out and, and talk to people. But I think that there are a lot of people on the left and the right who really do see eye to eye on, on sort of just basic core principles. I think the potential is there. 
you know, forgive me for this diversion, Nicole Ashoff, but as you mentioned unions, I was think a memory came to me, I'm going to have to write about it, haven't thought about it in 40 years, but in the 70s, I had a union job as a warehouse worker, and uh, there was a placard on the wall with the numbers you're supposed to call, including, you know, your union rep, your foreman, your, your local office, what happens if you have an accident. And then start, people started like with pens writing joking things underneath it, you know, of different, you know, numbers you could call, which ended with, and, and by the way, the workplace was almost evenly divided between black and white. And somebody wrote Black Panther Party and put the number of the Black Panther Party. And some white guy wrote Veterans of Foreign Wars and put a number. And the last entry was Your Mama. And a number. So, you know, there was, you're absolutely right. There was this kind of you know, exchange and even, you know, for all the racial injustices and how it was rolled out, some of the jobs created in the 1930s by government programs, the CCC and so on, those were times that people from different segments of society also uh, mingled. But, uh, you know, we don't, you know, we don't have a political culture that wants to create, um, you know, government jobs right now, unfortunately. So I guess in terms of wrapping up on the failed state question, um, you know, you've rightfully mentioned that we're not addressing the coronavirus properly. We're not giving people health care at a time when, you know, 4,000 people or whatever are dying a day. Um, but failed state, before you just, de- de- you know, call something a failure, you have to define what its mission is, right? Uh, if you presume that its mission is to democratically represent the people and meet their uh, physical and uh, uh, you know, economic needs, then yeah, we've been failing for a while and we're failing badly now. As you point out, if you feel the state's function is to prop up the uh, the financial system, it's working remarkably well, actually. So I guess I would conclude by asking you uh, by what I think is our shared defin- definition of a successful state, uh, what do you think that would look like? roughly, uh, in this context, in this moment. Yeah, I think part of, you know, actually bringing people together um, and building a kind of shared platform for action is to actually redefine, like, what what is this, what is a good state? Like, what, what expectations sh- should we have and what demands should we have about um, what our state should look like? If we actually want a state that is interested and response, interested in, in ordinary people and responsive to the needs of sort of working families, uh, we need to make a demand for that kind of state, right? And, and very specifically demand um, policies and, and programs and institutions that would meet those needs. And that demand, um, you know, requires uh, some kind of power and vision. The reason why the state, and we, when we talk about the state, we can think about it in terms of the executive or the Federal Reserve or, uh, you know, elected officials, right? It's a kind of nebulous idea. But the reason, you know, when we talk about the state as an agent of capital, right, to be, to be super ideological or as a, a sort of vehicle that just protects elites, well, that doesn't come, that's not sort of natural. That doesn't come out of nowhere, right? It's a representation of the kind of power and, and hierarchy of power that exists in the United States. So if we want to change that, uh, we have to actually redefine wh- what, what the state should be, right? What is the purpose of the state? And that might be reaching back into some kind of historical notions of when the state was better, but it's also about envisioning you know, in the future, how we actually want to take lessons from the struggles that are happening right now, whether it's, you know, Black Lives Matter or Me Too or the climate crisis, to actually take lessons from these struggles and and work them into actually building a new kind of state and a new vision for a state that we can be proud of. Well, I think that's really well said. And to me, uh, uh, the language is a critical piece of this, too, that we need to find, to me, and, you know, we need to find a way of express not only identifying this vision, but expressing it in language that attracts people and doesn't sort of enhance pre-existing divisions. Any thoughts on that before I let you go? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge challenge, which is why I, I 
often sort of, you know, err on the side of kind of issue based campaigns, right, to think right. about, well, what actually would make people's lives better, uh, particularly in this moment, right, housing security, um, actually, in instead of relying on monetary policy and dumping endless money into the into the bond markets, we could actually try some fiscal policy and, and create some work programs and fix our infrastructure and our schools, you know, these kinds of projects are things that people can agree on. But they to actually agree on these, you actually also need people to trust in the capacity of the state to do that, right? So this requires actually, you know, having grassroots electoral campaigns and institutions at, at the, at you know, the much more local level to actually rebuild that kind of trust. And I think that we, you know, we see some, we saw, see some of this happening. So I'm, I'm not uh, completely demoralized, despite what happened last week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not either. So I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate concluding on that note. Once again, my guest, Nicole Ashoff. And uh, for those of us who need our, to spell our last names when we call for reservations, whatever, it's A-S-C-H-O-F-F. -F. She's on the editorial board at Jacobin. She's a sociologist. Her latest book is The Smartphone Society, Technology, Power and Resistance in the New Gilded Age. And we've been talking about her article, American Capitalism is Working that's the problem. So, Nicole, once again, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Richard. It was a pleasure. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.